All right. How are we all doing today? All right. Well, I think some other people might trickle in here, but why don't we go ahead and get started? So my name is uh, Joseph Legacy. I'm one of the Movement Disorder Fellows at the University of Florida. I initially did medical school at the University of Central Florida, then went on to complete internship year and residency at the University of Florida, where I was fortunate enough to stick on and stay around for the fellowship. And I want to talk to you today about an important topic for anybody with Parkinson's, anybody who has family members with Parkinson's, and that's hospitalization. Um, as you can imagine, it's important for anybody who has any sort of disease to understand about that disease, and if they are or end up in the hospital, to know about their treatment, um, about what medications they take. But in particular, someone with Parkinson's it tends to be a little more of a complex condition, and the medications that we take are much more complex. Often we take medications every few hours, sometimes different dosages depending on the time of day, sometimes a different medication at night compared to the day. So knowing or preparing yourself for this, having the knowledge that um, when you go into the hospital, they might not be as familiar with Parkinson's, as familiar with those medications and what the best treatment and best care for you involves um, is, is an important thing to be aware of. And the best thing that um, we can do is, is have that knowledge and be prepared for that, which will eventually lead to the best and most successful hospitalization stay. So. So let's talk a little bit about some research that's been done looking at patients with Parkinson's who have to go to the hospital for whatever reason for additional care. And we've found that um, looking at patients at our hospital at Chance and at other institutions around the country that a patient with Parkinson's on average has a 50% higher chance or a 50% higher rate of being hospitalized compared to their peers without Parkinson's. And once they're in the hospital, it's more likely they're going to have a complication, and that often leads to longer hospital stays. And this has been looked at numerous times, like I said, multiple institutions, but fortunately there's a lot of precautions and measures you can take to help reduce these statistics and have the most successful and overall best hospital course and recovery process afterwards. And that's what we're going to focus on today. <coughs> so what are some of the common reasons that a patient with Parkinson's might end up in the hospital? Uh, a common one is an elective surgery, something that's planned, like we need a hip replacement, we need a knee replacement. Um, we end up in the hospital for that, very common, or it could be something that's unexpected, like a fall. Um, balance isn't as good with Parkinson's. Sometimes if we're not careful or if for whatever reason we trip, we fall, we have a fracture, you can end up in the hospital. And that's, as a side note, that's why every time you're seeing by a neurologist in the office, we always ask about how's your balance, are you falling? And then we, we really stress the importance of exercise, physical therapy, um, at least once a year, sometimes more based on how you're doing. Another common occurrence is infection. People with Parkinson's often have difficulty with swallowing. They can have food or liquid go down the wrong way, end up getting pneumonia. It could be something like a urinary tract infection, it leads us to be in the hospital. That can all create a change in mental status. You can be more confused. Um, it could be an unrelated condition, something like heart disease or kidney disease. Or it could be something directly related to Parkinson's, and like that difficulty with mobility leading to fall and then needing that more acute care in a hospital. So if we haven't been in a hospital yet with Parkinson's, we might have certain expectations from that hospital staff. Um, in a perfect world, if that doctor, physician, medical team who is taking care of you in the hospital um, has any questions about your treatment, your medication, or what should be done, they could easily contact your local neurologist, call them on the phone, answer questions, you're squared away and you move forward. But as we know, that always doesn't happen. Um, for turn of events, for whatever reasons, 
something happens later in the day, the office is closed, happens on the weekend, they can't reach the neurologist, and it could take sometimes a day or so. You know, we do our best to get back to you, but it's, it's not always perfect. And by the time you're getting out of the hospital, that message is just now getting to your neurologist and you're home, and then they call the hospital and they, the discussion never took place. So the more you can do to be aware of this and help prepare um, and realize that that doctor who's taking care of you is probably not as knowledgeable about Parkinson's as you or your family is. You know more about the medication, you know more about the management on a day-to-day -day basis, and that doctor may have seen patients with Parkinson's in medical school taking care of them um, intermittently or occasionally over the years, but they don't have the day-to-day -day experience that you, you have. So being able to help with a list of medications, under, um, explaining the importance of taking medication on time every day is, is something that can really help out, or just explaining what's going on, what your specific difficulties are that they need to be aware of. Um, and you also might come um, to, the, to a circumstance where you're in the hospital and you realize this hospital doesn't carry our medications. A lot of times they'll carry Cinemet. It's been around for a long time. It's inexpensive, and they'll keep that in stock. But other medications like Ritari, um, Nupro Patch, Azelect, a lot of times those medications aren't frequently stocked in certain hospitals. So it's, it's often a good idea to, to keep your medications handy. Um, and if you aren't able to get those medications, there's been certain circumstances where you'll have to, we'll have to call in a short supply of that medication. You'll have a family or friend pick it up, bring it into the hospital, and that's the medication you'll use during that hospital stay until you're able to get back home and get back to your normal settings if you weren't able to bring your medications in with you. Um, and there's also some difficulty that frequently happens with getting your medications on time. Yes? Sure. Okay, so we all know what the aware and care kit is. Mm hmm Yeah, I'm going to go over that. Care kit, you've got medication, right? You can put your medications in there. Mm hmm So I am not absolutely 100% sure that I can walk into, I live here in Jamestown. Sure. That I can walk into Shands or whatever and just say, here, here are my husband's medications. Um, my understanding is, is that everything has to be dispensed through the pharmacy. So, so, so how do we get that synergy? I mean, based on what you just said, how do we get that? So that's a very good question. Okay. So, so, so if the that is the question. So if the hospital doesn't carry those medications or have them in stock, you can bring your medications in. A lot of times they'll need to be checked in with the nurse once you get to the floor. Which nurse? Like the charge nurse? It, it might be the emergency room doctor, nurse. But a lot of times they'll let you keep your medication with you. But if you do eventually be admitted to the hospital, you go from the emergency room up to your room in the hospital, then they'll need to take inventory of your medication, but they should allow you, if they don't have it, to keep your medication and either you just give it to your loved one or take it yourself. Well, they take the medication from us. I mean, what you're saying makes me think I want to hold on to the aware and care kit and keep it with him because he needs his medicine every two hours. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, if I let go of that kit and I give it to whomever, how do I know when I'm going to see it again or if I'm going to see it again? So the, the, it should be something that's taken away and, and not given back to you. That's, and letting them know that initial discussion that you brought your medication in, if it's your husband who the medication is for, he takes this medication on a very strict regimen throughout the day. and. We know that a lot of hospitals don't carry these medicines, so I want to make sure he gets them. And it'll be a lot of times a nurse who takes inventory of them and will either give them, she or he will give them to your husband, or they might allow you to give it to them while they're in hospital yeah, stay. I'm going to put you on the spot here, but I think I'm doing that. Here's the deal. Yeah. You just said Cinemet, it's been around a long time. Mm -hmm. All my husband takes is Cinemet. Yeah. So I'm going to just speculate. Uh-huh. Yeah. So do I have a legal right to say, no, I can't wait for you to dispense it. I'm going to be dispensing that to my husband on the schedule that he needs to have it dispensed. 
So if they have that, that exact same medication, I would hold on to yours okay. and talk to the nurse and let them know that in two hours he needs this medication. Mm -hmm. And if you can, don't surrender. Don't surrender. yeah, I wouldn't give it the medication. If they have their own, there's no reason for them to take your medication. You can hold on to it. It's your medication. You keep that care kit with you. If, when it comes time for the medication, you've had the discussion, you let them know in two hours we need this medication and I need you to ensure that you can give it to him from the hospital in two hours or, 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 he, or he needs his medication and you develop a plan with that nurse and the doctor. Um, if it's the other circumstance where it's the medication they don't have, then that's a similar thing. Um, if they need to take inventory of it and then they hold on to it or give it to them or they, or they have you hold on to it and give it to you with them, it's all about just that communication, making sure you have a game plan. Um, okay. Yeah, and it's very important. It is, and that's one of the, the main things that I'll get to in a, a few more slides here. But the importance of that and how that changes the whole course of the hospital stay and complications if, our, if medications aren't received on the same time interval when they are usually taken at home. So, um, before we get to that, let me go for. I just want to go over a couple common things that you may. So we kind of went through this, that they, a lot of times they won't have the same amount of experience or knowledge, the difficulty like you mentioned with getting the medications as you take them at home. Um, so let's talk about some common things you might encounter while in the hospital. And worsening confusion is, is very common. It comes from all different causes. It can be infection, like a UTI or pneumonia. And the confusion might be gradually presenting itself the days before you go to the hospital, eventually it gets bad enough, you go in as an inpatient, you find out you have a urinary tract infection, and they start the treatment. And it will take, as the infection is slowly weaning down, infusion should, the confusion should gradually get better as well. Um, but there's other causes, and the whole idea is that you're in there, that's, their job is to help identify what's causing the confusion. And it might be due to dehydration, low blood pressure, electrolytes are out of whack. Um, it could be a new medication that was started while you're in the hospital for pain, for an, an antibiotic that you're not used to, causes a bad reaction. And one day, you're yourself, the next day or a few hours later, you're very different. You're confused, you're agitated. Um, and it's not that the Parkinson's itself got worse or not that you all of a sudden have dementia or Alzheimer's, it's just a reaction to what's going on. So a lot of symptoms can temporarily change, but it's due to what's going on and it's not something that's a long-term thing. It's something that's it's a reaction to that disease state or medication or infection. Um, and some, some things, this is simple as being in a different environment. You're used to being at home, you sleep better at home, you're more comfortable there. You go in a hospital, they're always waking you up, checking your vital signs, um, disturbing you throughout the night, it's loud, hospitals just aren't good places for sleep. And just that alone, with the new environment, reduced sleep can make you confused. And then there's this idea of what we call sundowning. And the way it's usually described, usually from a family member, the patient's doing great all day, gets later in the day, sun starts going down, we all of a sudden become more confused. It gets worse throughout the night, morning comes around, and you're close to back to where you were. And the same thing, it's just, with infection, with other things going on, you're in a, a state that you're just not at your best. Um, different conditions, worsening things, this confusion fluctuates day and night, and it just takes time and it will gradually go back to baseline. But it's not that you have a sudden dementia or Alzheimer's. It's, that's not the case. But it, it does happen, so it's something to be aware of. And what, what can we do as a family member? Um, like I said, it's the medical team's job to focus on the treatment, identify what's going on, and provide the, the correct treatment or management. But as a family, it's really important to help reorient the patient as, as much as possible. Things like just a, f a familiar va voice, familiar face, um, items from the home that we're used to, putting them around the room can really make a person more peaceful, more relaxed, less confused, um, and just having people that are familiar around, it can make things less um, disorienting. And one of the most important things you can help out um, is by making sure that the day and night stimulation is, is correct. 
During the day, you want them awake, interacting, lights on, TV on, windows open, sunlight coming in, you don't want them sleeping all day. And at night, lights off, TV off, and promoting the best night's sleep you can possibly do. And if working with your nurse or your medical team to help reduce disturbance during the night. Keep noise to a minimum. If you can not check vital signs, if we're stable enough to not wake up during the night to check vital signs or to um, have unneeded inner, you know, things that will wake them up, it can really make a big difference. And we'll shorten hospital stay, decrease confusion, and uh, overall have the success of the treatment and decrease complications. So let's talk a little bit about worsening of Parkinson's symptoms. We're in a hospital and all of a sudden it looks like Parkinson's just went from 5 to 10. It's tremors worse, balance is worse, rigidity is worse, we're not able to move around like we could and are we, a lot of times we're worried that Parkinson's all of a sudden just became moderate to severe overnight. And that's not, Parkinson's does not progress that rapidly. So it means that, not that Parkinson's by itself is worse, it, there's something else we need to find out that's causing this. There's an underlying cause, which often is an infection or some other condition that's creating those symptoms to appear worse, to be more severe, but it's a temporary thing. And it should gradually get better as that other thing is being treated. So we, a lot of times we say Parkinson's is jealous, that if there's something else going on, it wants attention too. So you, you have a pneumonia, Parkinson says, hey, I'm still here, I'm going to move more, I'm going to shake more, I want attention. Um, and for whatever reason, it's, it's very frequently observed, it's, it's going to happen, and you just have to realize that with time, it's going to go back to your baseline. And the things that you can do in the meantime while in the hospital that whenever you can get back to your normal routine as far as moving, exercising, even if you're in a hospital for a knee replacement, a hip replacement, you can still have physical therapy come and work with you. You can still have occupational therapy, move your arms, help with strength, keep you mobile, work with a leg that didn't have surgery, um, if possible get you out of bed to the chair, walk around the hospital and stay strong, help with conditioning and not have the, the rehab process once we get out of the hospital be longer than it needs to be. I mean, that physical therapy in the hospital, moving around, moving as much as you can, makes a big difference. Um, so we know that patients, let's see here, with Parkinson's, on average, have a longer hospital stay when they're not getting their medications on time. This is what we kind of talked about previously. So the things that really make a difference are keeping a list of your medications up to date on your, your person, in your wallet, in your purse, to be able to show them when you're in the hospital, this is what I take at this time, at this dosage, so they can really get a clear picture. Even sometimes the, the list they get from the pharmacy, it's a little ambiguous as far as when it should be given. It'll just say, five times a day, but maybe you take it at specific times, not just five times. Um, and the hospital may see five times a day, and, but they'll pick what those five times are. And it's based on their schedule. Um, so what does, one, what does one, that is a central question. Yeah. What does one do about that? Because with a Parkinson's patient, they can become disoriented, mm -hmm. Yeah. Which brings me right back to the aware and caregiver. I don't see, as a caregiver, I don't see the wisdom in me having to deal with their schedule. I just don't. So could you, can you enlighten me as to how, I guess I have a bad attitude. I don't know. I, I mean, this, this is a very unique yeah. situation here. So sometimes it can be more of a simple issue where the medication that comes to them from the pharmacy or that it's in your records says five times a day. And, and that can be, and as long as that fits into their system with five times a day, maybe you start your medication at six, but their system says five times a day starts at eight. 
So, exp yeah, so, it, so having that exact time to show them to d and have a, a, a real straightforward conversation with the nurse and the doctor so they can adjust, I mean, we can adjust the times in the computer. And that would be who, the hospitalist? The hospitalist, and so you want the nurse, well, she'll probably know first because I mean, you might see her first when you're, or he or she, when they first check you in the hospital. And then when the doctor comes in, he or she letting them know that these are the times you need to take it, and they'll adjust the times in the computer. If, it, if the five a day starts at eight, usually for them, they can adjust the timing of each medication, put the dosage in, and that way it pops up on the, the nurse's queue when this dose is due. Um, and if they don't have that list with the times written out and exact dosages, that can be, it can be a hazy area where they're not quite sure, and it'll default to times that aren't the norm. So For a lot of times, it does require a conversation. It's, it's something that they're used to giving medications. A lot of times, let's say for heart disease, blood pressure, it's a once a day medication, sometimes twice. Sometimes you take it breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but Parkinson's is such a unique disease in itself to need medication sometimes every two, three hours. Um, they don't deal with it on a frequent enough basis to have a system that can be fluid and go right from your home medications to the hospital stay, and it does require, you know, some additional discussion. Is it possible in these kind of situations to go through the portal and contact the neurologist? Do the neurologists ever get involved to, in that kind of situation to say this is the patient's regimen? Yeah, it's, and it really kind of depends on the hospital. So at, at Shands, for instance, we have inpatient neurologists. They're in contact with the outpatient neurologist. A lot of the, the outpatient clinical neurologists that we see in clinic that do Parkinson's, a lot of times they're in the hospital as well. And they switch off between outpatient and inpatient. So in a large academic center like that, it's a lot of times it's easier to communicate for that inpatient neurologist to discuss what their, but it really, it's, situation dependent on the hospital and how easy the communication is and how easy it is to get your outside records put into their computer if it's a, a different system in a different state. Um, That's yeah. So, so let me ask you about Shane. Mm -hmm. I, I knew who was here. Sure. Okay, so, so obviously my husband's got a big EMR uh -huh. with all of us all over there. I mean, so as a caregiver, I'm dealing with a, a fracture or whatever it is and I'm, yeah. you know, making assumptions that they know everything about my husband because of putting EMR. Are you saying I'm going to have to ask for an in-house neurologist, request a neurology consult, and so on, when I'm in the, when I'm in the emergency room? So, it's, so it, it depends if, if they have a question that, you, that you're not able to answer, or it's very case to, or situation dependent. If if, um, for instance, the neurologist has, or the inpatient doctor, emergency room doctor, inpatient internal medicine doctor has experience with Parkinson's, he might be able to look at the medicines, put them in the computer, no problem, everything's squared away. But if it's something that's less familiar, that they haven't seen as much, or don't fully uh, have a, uh, a consistent experience with the medication on that frequency, then it might be as simple as you handing them this list, this is what my husband takes, you know, this is how we should be, it should be given, you set up in the computer and then you're off and running. But if there's more questions beyond that or if they have, if they don't feel comfortable with something, then they should call their inpatient neurologist or your neurologist to, to clarify well, things. I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, 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 this is, this but, is why we're here. But you're a fellow, so I'm, I'm just sure. giving you feedback from the trenches. And yeah. trenches are, you've got an EMR, uh -huh. okay? Yeah. So I'm trying to understand as a caregiver when I'm dealing with the stress of the situation, yeah. why this is up to me to protect my husband. Do, do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Because that's really what it comes down to here. If I may, the luck of the draw is I may get that person you just described mm -hmm. who, who understands and goes, oh yeah, and puts everything in. But then again, yeah, I'm like it. I'm like it. I'm like it. Uh, but if I don't, then I'm 
pushing a boulder up a hill. So I'm dealing not only with the strength of the situation, mm -hmm. I'm also dealing with a system yeah. that seemingly, I, I, help me understand when you have an EMR, when everything's in there, I don't understand how there can be such a disconnect. So it's... I did put you on the spot. So, so one thing that I will say that as, as a, a recent resident, um, and being in, inpatient more recently in the, for the last four years of my life, at we, yeah, at Shands, uh -huh. uh, that's probably in the last five years of my life, four was in the hospital. So seeing that s circumstances where sometimes it goes really well, um, where the EMR is in place, medications are entered correctly, and the nurse is familiar with what's going on, it just gives it on time every time and it works fine. And, but there's other situations, and, and what usually comes up is that if the medication is that increased frequency where when they're just nurses taking care of multiple patients mm -hmm. and to accomplish the task every couple hours, it's, it becomes very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think that on average, if the EMR has a medication three times a day, maybe four times a day, it's, it fits into the schedule, it's much more easy to accomplish. But if, if your husband or a loved one is on a medication that's more frequent, it's gonna, ta it's gonna take an, yeah. So it's gonna be, yeah. Does hmm? that mean that the spouse could dispense it? Does that ever happen where they allow the wife to? That's it, it, what I'm doing, that's my plan. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's something that you, I think. It's allowed, is that right? And it, so it does. So it's, I think there is, so there's multiple units at Shands, mm -hmm. and it kind of depends to some degree what unit you're on mm -hmm. and what level of care you're requiring. If you, and let's say if, if for instance, your husband is in a situation where he's having more problems swallowing or he's not as awake or interactive, then giving him his regular medications by mouth isn't a good idea. So it's, wow. it's gonna require a conversation if you're on a, a very complex schedule, it's gonna, that initial conversation is, is probably gonna have to happen in the majority of circumstances. I think from one of the most, I was a medical social worker working with Hawkins mm -hmm. for many, many years, and this is the problem that, one of the biggest problems that I would hear about, one of them you know, would be what happens when people go into the hospital and they can't give them their own medicine, mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, I don't know that much about what happens at Chance, um, but I know in other hospitals where I've, where I've received, where I've worked, mm -hmm. um, that, that used to be a problem. Mm -hmm. the caregivers being able to give the medication themselves, especially if they have multiple, you know, not just Cinemet, but these other medications and the hours and the times, it would, this would be a problem that mm -hmm. would come up, and everybody's experience would be different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like a you know, like a caregiver that is yeah. physically and mentally able to be there a lot of the time. It makes all the difference in the world. It, it, it does. All the difference. I mean, right there, because it's, it's not going to be perfect. Yeah. Not in their own environment. But I think that that's the thing. Yeah. You know, and I understand why Kathy's been bringing up because it. Well, we, he's the, you started it, and again, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. No problem. That's that's why I'm here today. You hit, you hit a nerve. Sure. So, so you started off with the very sobering statistics. Uh -huh. um, and so if anybody is looking at those statistics at the very beginning yeah. here, don't you think that with the brain trust that we have, that we can figure out, well, why is that? Well, we're telling you why. This is why. Yeah. Because it's, there's, a system, there's a system in place that I understand is perfect. I understand that there's, you know, we need more people and all that kind of stuff. But these are Mm -hmm. I'm not making it up. Yeah. See, my biggest fear is because I'm going to go in there with a, they've never heard of anybody taking Cinemax 10 times a day. Dr. Oaken is my husband's doctor. We're not making it up. You know, sure. I would present that as a list and somebody would look at that and say, well, that's not possible. Nobody can be taking it 10 times a day. Well, sorry, but he is. Yeah. Only people who are in the Parkinson's world and the doctors 
Yeah. And that's uh, that truly is the whole reason we're having this conversation today is that for some people, that's the million dollar question. And that, that's why we do this research. That's why we look at it. And it's, 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 it's not a simple fix. I mean, we all know that. It's a system based. It's, it's, a, it's, 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 yeah. And It is. And luckily, I wasn't as urgent, you know, with my medication and to those things. But, um, yeah. They're just, they're just stuff that, I mean, you see, you say system, but that system serves a lot of different kinds of people, a lot of different kinds of patients. I mean, it, it, there's that obviously, a, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely not a perfect system. It does well with some things and not well or as well with others. Um, everybody in there in the hospital, they, it's not that they don't want to give the medication on time. It's not that they're intentionally doing this. It's, 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 it's um, and it's a, definitely a work in progress, and that's what we're doing. But, and, but the best thing we can do right now is work on it from the medical side and then prepare from the patient side, that this is going on, this, a lot of things will happen, some of these may happen, and to be prepared for it and to have uh, you know, a plan in place and to do the best you can to help go things as, go as smoothly as possible. This care kit is really the best thing that's come along for a long time because if you, yeah. if you have it up to date, I just looked at mine the other day and some of the stuff was out of date, you know, it's in there. Does everybody have a, a care kit here? Well, we have, we should have a box of kits up front, yeah. so um, you can always get a new one if you'd like. Okay. And if they run out for whatever reason, you can always contact the National Parkinson's Foundation. Yeah. They can send you a new list, they can send you a new packet, and also all the updated information is on the website itself. So just going on there to be able to provide that. It's, I get my bet is in the last seven years, is it would, it's interactions with the medications that we currently use. Right. And it's the, the levodopa or the medicines and things like Azelect that are interacting. So it shouldn't be that different, but double checking is always a good idea. Let's see here. Um, so I think another important, let's see how much time we have here. Um, another important point is that the idea of being NPO. Do we all know what that means? Uh, yeah. So that's the idea that we're, if we're going to have a procedure or something done the next day, that surgeon or interventionalist may say, I don't want you to have anything from, say, midnight until the procedure. And that means no food. And if, if they put it in, their order in is nothing by mouth, even without medication, you could go from midnight to 10 a.m. without medication. So letting them know that you take medication during the night or early in the morning is, is an important thing because they may not realize that at first, you know, first discussion because if they're not as familiar with Parkinson's. So a lot of times they can make it MPO but with medications. So you can still get your medications. You can still be able to help out, move, transfer from the, from the bed to the wheelchair, to the operating room, whatever it is. Um, and a lot of times it just takes that, making them aware. So then they can change that order to add in medications but not food. Um, this is 
one of the research projects that we did at Shands looking at patients with Parkinson's compared to patients that in the hospital that had a prolonged stay. So it's so it's this is looking at so this is so we compared patients with Parkinson's in the hospital compared to patients also in the hospital with, with Parkinson's who had a prolonged stay. So these patients, this is just the statistics for the patients with prolonged stay, and we found that patients that had this extended stay longer than expected at least on one occasion, didn't get their medication on time within the first hour. Yeah. And then we found that 21% didn't get it within the first two hours, 14% within the first three hours. That's 50, 34 and 21 and 50% or something right there. Mm -hmm. And then on 31%, at least on one occasion, they missed, they missed a dose altogether, just completely omitted. And we this is at Shands. This, this is a large medical center. So this is very validating. This is something that yeah, it's something that does take place, and even at a center with yeah. Someone looking out, you know, if it knows you well, knows what you need and what's been going on the last couple of days, especially when you're not yourself, you're dehydrated, you're not feeling as well, could be more confused, and yeah, it's definitely important. Did you have an advocate? Yeah, I mean, my husband, and he, you know, you know how you can go to advocate for yourself, and he was just Sure. Because those people who live in danger, um, what I have found is with these satellites, you know, one can also have, where's the other one? There's two. There's Spring Hill. Yeah. Spring Hill. Mm -hmm. right. So if you go there, you will get the advice. Spring Hill is a good one. That's a good tip, and so sometimes the main yeah. the main emergency room is so busy that right. it, it's, it's possible. And then when a bed opens up, they'll call from Spring Hill again. Well, this was a shame. I'll make that clear. Yeah, sure. And I was admitted for eight weeks, so wow, serious problem. Yeah, just just the medication issue alone, we found that that when you're missing medications or medication is late, on average it adds about three days to your hospital stay. So we're running, running a little bit short on time, but if... Well, this is, this is why we're here. We want to... This is for you. What, and this often leads to the best conversation and gets the most information out there. Yeah, but I can tell you that this is something that we hear, we know about it, and it's good to hear it again, and we're working on it, and we obviously still have some, some work to go. So yeah, Dr. Al so Dr. Almeida, he's one of the, there is a few of the movement disorder neurologists yeah. that go back and forth. They'll spend a week inpatient, and then the following week they'll be back in the clinic, and they spend various numbers of weeks throughout the year just on the inpatient service. 
Um, so Dr. Deeb occasionally does inpatient. Um, I mean, most of, a good number of them do, but some of them are more sparing than others. Some have more weeks, some have less. Kind of depends, but um, it's and if a movement disorder doctor isn't the main neurologist taking care of the inpatient service, they can they know who those neurologists are in the movement clinic. So it's in that circumstance, it does help to be in touch with your colleagues that you know that have a large movement center just you know outside the hospital. Um, So this, this, this next slide, this is all the different kind of medications to avoid. And a lot, of, a lot of these are ones that are in the care packet. So it, we can, if you don't have one of these, then this lists all these out. And I think this, just jumping ahead to show you what's in this, if you don't already know, that a lot of this information it will be easily at your fingertips in this care packet here. The Parkinson's alert bracelet. If for some reason you need medical attention, paramedic comes you know, to help, they can see right away that you have Parkinson's and maybe while your speech is a little different, while you're moving not as, quite as easy and what medications to avoid and which ones are, are best. This just lets them know right away. This the wear and care booklet here has most of the information we talked about today and a, kind of a whole action plan to help you prepare and, you know, for the leading up to the hospital, in the hospital, going home. This is a, a great booklet that has pretty much everything we talked about today. You mentioned all, all these different, whole different ones you can fill out, keep one with you, you can easily hand it to the physician or nurse taking care of you. And this is, I think we were talking about all these, these cards that say the main Parkinson's related features and then medications on the back to avoid and what alternatives. This is great. And this is something you can easily tear these off and hand to anybody who needs one. And then there's also some more things about some people have a DOOPA pump for levodopa, has a card. For more information about DBS, if you happen to have DBS. Exactly. Okay. We're just now finishing up, yeah. Um, if you have, happen to have DBS, the manufacturer will give you a lot more information than this about your specific device um, and what to avoid. If you can get an MRI, what kind of MRI. But this is at least a card that can give some basic information and where to find more information. And more fact sheets about Parkinson's, again, with different medications you may be on, what they do, and which ones to avoid. So if you don't have one of these tips, you can, some, someone can have this one if they'd like. And Amanda has more up at the front as well.